Sometime in the next millennium, when one looks back on the annals of Florida State football, it will be hard to overlook the talented offensive schemes that Seminole fans have come to love. Many see Florida State football as an offensive juggernaut, always on the verge of establishing new trends in college football. While the quarterback takes most of the credit, it is the fleet-footed running backs that give those teams their balance. Florida State has had a rich history of running backs, as different in characteristics as one can imagine. Put them all together and you'd have a running back for the ages. Separately, they each had a style so unique that they were able to make their own mark in the Seminole record books. I really don't give too many moves or anything like that. I'm kind of a slasher. You know, I can, I can cut back and that type of thing. I'm a strong runner. I can break tackles. My running style is more of an elusive, slashing style type runner where it enables me to take advantage of my size and ability. Some had the speed to just blaze down the sidelines past defenders. Others simply ran through opposing defenses on their way to the goal line. Others would become known for their versatility, whether catching a screen pass, blocking, or getting the extra yards needed for a first down. Some were considered slow by today's standards, but could electrify you with dazzling moves. And finally, it was always the ones small in size who were the biggest in heart, character, and determination. No matter what their style, one thing remained the same. These great runners helped to set the standard of success that every Seminole running back works towards. Their garnet and golden legs helped to make them the greatest running backs in Florida State Seminole football history. When thinking about Florida State's greatest running backs, one name that will always come to mind is that of Greg Allen. In 1981, this high school All-American running back from Milton, Florida, burst onto the scene as a freshman at Florida State. You might say, he hit the ground running. Greg, he was a great back. Uh, he broke in with us as a freshman. Uh, he, his first start, I think he got 206 yards against LSU, which was a record back in those days. Also, he, in one of our ball games, he had a total offense of over 400 something yards, a turn, a turn in kickoff, a turn in, uh, and running the football. Had a fantastic game out here. He wound up with 417 all-purpose yards on the day, an NCAA record for freshmen. Allen finished his first year with over 800 yards rushing. Not bad, considering his first start didn't come until the seventh game of the season. By the time his sophomore year started, the word was out on Greg Allen. But even that wasn't enough for teams to slow down the fact that Bobby Bowden dubbed Crazy Legs. Well, if you watch the film and you watch me run, it just looks like my legs are just uh, out of control but not really out of control, but that's just the way, that's just the way it looks. Allen ran crazy again in 1982, leading the nation in touchdowns with 21. Even though he never started a game, he was still splitting time with Ricky Williams. But FSU was using his talents every way possible. Catching passes out of the backfield, returning kicks, you name it, Greg Allen did it. His 1,524 all-purpose yards was 11th in the country that year, as well as honorable mention All-America honors. A look at the FSU record books finds Allen as the fourth leading rusher in school history, 
as well as the rushing TD leader, even though he still had never been the primary back in the offense. As the 1983 season kicked off, Greg Allen was no longer just a decoy. He was finally the main man, and he remained in that role over his junior and senior campaigns. His last two seasons saw him run for over 2,000 yards total, even though he had nagging injuries at the end of both of those years. But unfortunately, in the Arizona game, I, uh, that's when I fought my cartilage and my knee. So that delayed me. I didn't get a chance to finish up the year. Really, he's one of the most uh, underrated backs we've ever had because at that time, we were not the quality of team we were later on when Sammy Smith and the other tailbacks came along. By the time Greg Allen left Florida State, he had set or equaled 26 school records. He was a two-time consensus All-American, and up to that point, he was FSU's highest ever finisher in Heisman Trophy balloting. He wound up his career with 3,769 yards and 44 rushing touchdowns. Even today, his name still tops numerous categories in the FSU record book. I didn't think about it. And when you don't think about it, you do it. If you're thinking about it, then you're worrying about doing it. And so you don't perform as much or as good as you, you can. I was always told that if you just do your work, then somebody will see the good work you do. And that's all I did. Greg Allen certainly left his mark on the FSU record books and on Seminole football history. Just as Greg Allen was finishing his FSU career, the next great Seminole back was warming up for his run in the backfield. Sammy Smith arrived in Tallahassee in the fall of 1985 as part of a heralded recruiting class that also featured Pat Tomberlin and Deion Sanders. Smith was a parade All-American who featured an awesome blend of power and speed, the likes of which hadn't been seen before at Florida State. He's to the 30, the foot races under the 20, to the 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Smith! He was six foot two and 221 pounds, yet he had sprinter speed. And when you look at the numbers, they compared favorably to a back thing, Herschel Walker. Yeah, Sammy is probably one of the most gifted uh, tailbacks we've ever had at Florida State. You know, he was big, he had world-class speed, and uh, he had power, and, he, and he, could, he could run by you. He could just run by you. I'm talking about he was a back that everybody in the country wanted, and we were very lucky to get him at Florida State. Smith's debut in 1985 was shortened as he took a medical hardship due to a stress fracture in his leg. But in 1986, he began to display his talents on the field. He was a freshman All-American and tallied his first ever 100-yard rushing game against Florida. He capped off his freshman season by winning MVP honors at the All-American Bowl after running for 205 yards in a win over Indiana. 1987 is the year Sammy Smith became a household name across the nation. He rumbled and raced to an eye-opening 7.1 yards per carry average. He broke numerous school records, including single season rushing with 1,230 yards and the most 100-yard games in a season with seven. If he couldn't run by you, he would run over you. Just ask East Carolina, the team that he ran for 244 yards against. That's a figure that's still the second highest one game total in FSU history, behind only Greg Allen. Smith's junior season was not one for the record books as he was plagued by injuries. He rushed for only 577 yards on the season, but 212 of those came in one game against Tulane. And once healthy again, he plowed through Auburn for 115 yards in the Sugar Bowl becoming the first back to go over the century mark against the Tigers in 25 games. That effort won him MVP honors in the Sugar Bowl, and it also propelled him to the first round of the NFL Draft, where he was taken ninth overall by the Miami Dolphins. Smith wound up his career with over 2,500 yards rushing, a total of his fourth on the FSU all-time list. 
Sammy Smith's power and speed helped earn him a place among FSU greats. Before Sammy Smith was even born, a back by the name of Bobby Wren was the top band in the Seminole backfield. He was the Seminole's leading rusher in 1956 with 596 yards on 102 carries. a running back. He was a quarterback and a receiver and a punter and a return specialist. As a matter of fact, after leading the Knowles in rushing in 1956, he led them in passing in 1957. seven touchdowns and he finished his FSU career as arguably the best all-around back through Florida State's first three decades of modern football. Wren was an extremely versatile back during his days at FSU. But the Seminoles have seemingly always featured backs that are multi-dimensional. Case in point, Edgar Bennett, a talented blocking back that split time between the fullback and tailback spots during his career. And throughout, he was always a gifted pass catcher. He's probably been one of our most productive fullbacks uh, since, uh, since I've been here at Florida State. He was a big tailback playing fullback and just he was perfect, perfect for what you were looking for at that position. When Bennett came to FSU, he was a fullback, and he was behind Dane Williams, Keith Ross, Stanley Hall, Marion Butts, and Paul Moore on the depth chart. Yet, he was still one of three true freshmen to letter in 1987. He said you can join that, um, that long list and wait your turn, or you can um, come in and play and help our team immediately at fullback. So I thought about it for give or take five seconds, and I said, well, I'll, play, I'll move to fullback. In 1988, he took a medical red shirt after breaking his arm. But when he returned the next season, he was a staple in the FSU offense and remained one for his final three seasons. Taking a 13-7 lead. And for Bennett, that is his fourth rushing touchdown of the season. And gee, he got two last week, he got two this week. Ask Edgar Bennett what he does best, run, catch, or block. And he'll answer all three. You, know, um, you just gotta be able to do all three things that way when you're you know, thrown into the football game, you can pretty much be accountable. You can take care of your job. He gave FSU the simple or the spectacular, and he gave his all. He fumbled only one time as a junior. Even though he could have turned pro, 
He returned for his senior season and finished second on the team in reception. Again, Weldon hands it off to Bennett. Bennett pops free to the right side. Bennett with the ball to the 40. Bennett to the 42-yard line. Oh, Edgar Bennett on a quick opener. Bennett accomplished this even with the Seminoles featuring four future NFL players at that position. That 1991 senior season got off to a beautiful start for Bennett, who got either a first down or touchdown the first five times he touched the ball that year. He was the star in the Pigskin Classic against BYU, but that game was just one of many highlights for Bennett. Pigskin Classic, that was a great opportunity out there in California. Um, we had a great time, we won the football game, and I was able to you know, just put up some good numbers running the ball as well as receiving. A guy that could run like a tailback, block like a fullback, and catch passes like a receiver. With his always pleasant personality, Edgar Bennett was a favorite with the fans and a star on the field. During Bennett's senior year, FSU featured perhaps the best backfield in the country. Because along with Edgar were Casey Weldon and Amp Lee, all of whom would go on to enjoy lengthy NFL careers. The most electric of those players was the guy whose name fit the bill, Amp Lee. He didn't have shocking speed, but he did have some electrifying moves. Amp Lee has that uncanny ability to change speeds, change gears, shift one way or the other, and follow blockers about as good as any running back I've seen. Amp did not have the great speed, although he played quite a few years in pro football. But boy, he could cut on a dime, he could change direction, he had excellent balance, and he was very smart. One of the smartest runners we've had here. If there's anything there, he's going to get it. I remember the first game he started was against Auburn right out here, because our starting tailback was injured, and he got 100. 15 or 20 yards his first start and that was a pretty good indication he was going to be a heck of a back. As a freshman, Lee burst into the spotlight scoring two out of the first three times he touched the ball. Once on a six yard run and once on an 88 yard reception. He was second on the team in rushing that year but that was just a prelude for his next two seasons as a Seminole. During 1990 and 1991, Lee was a human highlight film. He totaled 32 TDs during those two years, leading the team in scoring for both seasons. He didn't necessarily outrun the competition, but he certainly left more than a few defenders grasping at air. He was a groin pull waiting to happen. His more memorable games came against FSU's biggest opponents. Amp would always rise to the occasion in the big games. As a sophomore, he found the end zone three times in a 45 to 30 win over Florida. And as a junior, he dazzled and dazed the maize and blue at Michigan Stadium with a performance that ranks up with the all-time greatest by an FSU running back. From the eye set. Toss sweep comes to Lee. Lee comes left side, waits for a block, makes it cut to the five. Touchdown, Florida State. He is an amazing runner. Unbelievable. Against the Wolverines, Lee shredded a Big Ten defense by rushing for 122 yards, catching three passes for 79 yards, and scoring two touchdowns, including one that Seminole fans will never forget. 25, Lee spins back to the 20. Lee with a block to the 15. We go to Michigan, we're number one in the nation, they're probably number two or three. And we play up there, a beautiful day, 105,000 people there, and uh, Amp put on a show. I mean, he had some long runs, beautiful runs, changed direction, this side of the field over to that side of the field. And then I'd have to say this, I believe about Amp, I think he had the best hands of any tailback we've had. On third down, pro set, Weldon looking right, swings the pass out to Lee, makes the catch of the 40, Lee to the sideline to the 30, Lee cuts it inside to the 20-yard line. Lee turned pro after his junior year, but he still stands in the Seminoles' top 10 in rushing, and he's number three overall in career rushing touchdowns with 30. Ampley was not the biggest or the fastest, but he was definitely one of the greatest.
It's been said many times that good things come in small packages. Over the years, that's been especially true of Florida State tailbacks. Pound for pound, they pack as much excitement into every play as anyone on the field. And that was certainly the case with a Georgia peach Bobby Bowden recruited named Dexter Carter. Dexter Carter was a, really an overachiever, but he had a lot of talent, but he didn't have size. In other words, he could catch the ball, he could run the ball, he blocked, he'd run hard, he was tough, he's dedicated, hard worker. I really had to fight um, uh, the, 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 the smallest type running back um, to try to get an opportunity to play. And uh, so it didn't really phase me coming to Florida State. All I needed was the opportunity. Carter was just five foot nine, but he could explode at any given moment. Just ask any fan that packed Doak Campbell Stadium on October 28, 1989. Carter took FSU's first play from scrimmage and sent FSU fans into a frenzy. Miami would never recover and the Knowles would post a 24 to 10 win. For the game, Carter ran for 142 yards. That was one of only a handful of 100 yard rushing games turned in by Carter in his FSU career. He also found other ways to torment the opposition, like returning punts, or catching passes out of the backfield, or returning kickoffs. As a matter of fact, Carter's 89 heroics weren't the first he turned in against Miami. As a freshman, Carter teamed with Keith Ross for a 100-yard razzle-dazzle kickoff return against the Canes at the Orange Bowl. He played big and big games. In the 1988 Fiesta Bowl, Carter snared four passes for a total of 89 yards all part of an amazing 31 to 28 FSU win over Nebraska. Two years later in the Fiesta Bowl, against the same Nebraska Cornhusker team, Carter again helped knock off Nebraska with a combined 119 yards rushing and receiving, including a 10 yard TD catch. During his career, Carter split time with Sammy Smith, his backfield teammate for three of his four years. But Sammy was a bigger back Though quick, Dexter was still like a stick of dynamite when he got the ball. By the time Sammy moved on to the pros, Dexter got just one year as the main ball carrier. That was 1989, and he made the most of it, scoring eight touchdowns as the Knowles went 10-2 and, and finished the year ranked third nationally. Carter still ranks among the top 10 rushers of all time at Florida State, and he's still in the top 10 for career rushing touchdowns as well. Carter was truly an all-purpose back, and during his four years at Florida State, he demonstrated enough skill and speed to warrant a first-round selection in the NFL draft by the San Francisco 49ers. Dexter Carter, small in size, huge on the field. Another Seminole drafted in the first round by the 49ers was William Floyd. But Floyd was taken for different reasons than Carter. He was taken because of the punishing, bruising style he employed from the fullback spot. Floyd's not in the top 10 of any of FSU's career rushing categories. But if you ask FSU players or coaches who they'd most like to have in a foxhole with them, no doubt William Floyd would be the first running back on the list. William Floyd had it all as a fullback. In fact, I noticed where some magazine had listed him in the past uh, decade as one of the top fullbacks in the country, uh, all over the country. He was big, he was strong, he was fast, uh, he was confident, uh, he could block, he blocked as good as any fullback we've had. He could get you the short yardage, he was a, a team leader. Uh, uh, he had, uh, if I was looking for another fullback right now, I would look for his type. He was tough, 
He was mean, and he wasn't about to put up with anything from anybody. Back sack on the last series, a loss of 10. Ward in the shotgun. Three wide receivers. Inside handoff to William Floyd. Comes to the left side. Blocker to the 25. Floyd to the 30. Makes the tackle to the 35. He's knocked out of bounds to the 38-yard line. Behind William Floyd. From the two. Hand off to Floyd. He goes in. Touchdown, Florida State. Slanting run. Left tackle. Nobody touched him. And he'll get the call. He's got a Florida State touchdown. William Floyd off left guard behind Tyre Laurian. He was the enforcer on offense. And if defenses dared go after Charlie Ward, they had to go through number 44. Yeah, Floyd also, when he's not carrying the ball out there in the shotgun, he says, I'm Charlie Ward's personal guardian. I'm there to protect him against any and all blitzes. William Floyd loved the game of football, and his passion carried over on the field. He was emotional, and he was not about to be intimidated. 245 pound junior. What did he tell us? If you mention finesse around me, you're talking sissy. I am no sissy. He's the receiver down there. William Floyd, the fullback. And he is a low. Look at him breaking tackles now on the clear at the 30. And caught from behind by Mike Anderson. So William Floyd gets his crowd stirred. Floyd served as FSU's spiritual and emotional leader on the field. And somehow it's not surprising that FSU's football national title came on his watch. He worked hard. Uh, uh, he wouldn't back off from anything. Uh, he never slacked off. He worked hard. He played when he was injured, you know, when he was hurt a little bit. And uh, he, had, he had a great, uh, he, he had a, a, a great personality, very, very out, outgoing personality that everybody liked. Charlie Ward was the hero. The defense was the dominator. But William Floyd was the soldier who stood watch over that Seminole team. But William didn't stop with that championship. Early in his pro career, Floyd also picked up a Super Bowl ring with the 49ers. You see, more than anything, William Floyd was a winner. In the same good things come in small packages mode comes Larry Key. That's been true of a number of FSU running backs over the years, and it's certainly true with the Seminoles' leading rusher during the decade of the 70s, Larry Key. Key wasn't recruited heavily in Florida except for Tampa, but he ended up getting a chance at FSU. And the 5'10", 180-pounder made the most of that opportunity. As a freshman, he ran for 625 yards, including 123 in a dramatic 8-7 loss to Alabama in Tuscaloosa. But as a sophomore, Coach Darrell Mudra changed the offense to the wing tee, and Key was moved to a receiver position. But he didn't stay there long. By the end of the season, he was back at the halfback spot, where he would remain for the rest of his career. When Bobby Bowden came to Tallahassee in 1976, he noticed Key's talent and utilized it immediately. During Bowden's first year, he enjoyed his best season as a Seminole, rushing for 712 yards, including a 97-yard touchdown scamper against Virginia Tech. That play was the longest run from scrimmage among Division I schools that year, and it still stands as the longest run in FSU history. On that play, he broke Tom Bailey's all-time FSU career rushing record, and before his career was done, Larry Key would become the first Seminole to rush for over 2,000 yards. In fact, it's hard to remember Key ever having an off game. Perhaps what is most memorable during the Key tenure is the tradition that FSU fans adopted of shaking their keys in the stands every time Larry Key touched the ball. 
Key's success came as a result of his strong forearms, his relentless leg drive, and his unusual all-around strength. These attributes made him a difficult back to bring down. This was especially true his senior season. He ran for 1,117 yards and helped FSU to an amazing 37-9 win over Florida. He was the first back to ever go over 1,000 yards in school history. And that year, he finished second nationally in all-purpose rushing. He capped his career with a Tangerine Bowl victory over Texas Tech. And uh, it was his last year. And we, had, again, had a pretty tight ball game, and he broke a kickoff about 97 yards for a touchdown and broke that game over. still stands as the third all-time leading rusher in school history. Larry Key, the desire to excel at one of FSU's greatest. The cupboard was by no means bare when Key's time at Florida State was done because the guy who had been blocking for Key now moved into a more prominent position as a main ball carrier. Mark Lyles came to Florida State in 1976, but had to wait his turn while Larry Key finished up his career. Once Key moved on, Lyles became the key running back for Bobby Bowden. Even so, Lyles was by no means a forgotten man during his first two years at FSU. Big sophomore fullback Mark Lyles makes it 21 to 6 with this diving touchdown in close. As a freshman, he was the Knolls' third leading rusher, and he was a major factor in FSU's upset of 13th ranked Boston College. Lyles was not your traditional running back. He was 6'4 and 230 pounds. From the moment he arrived in Tallahassee, it was just a question of when he would put it all together. Here he runs 43 yards up the middle. A big guy can scoop. I wanted to be a big fish in a small pond. And when Bowden was, he was, this was his first year. And there was more opportunity when you come with your actual coach. You can grow with the program. And that's what we basically did as freshmen. Mark Laos is the first uh, big back we signed when I came to Florida State in 1976. We signed him out of Buffalo, New York. He was about 6'4 and weighed about 225 or 30 pounds and a big back. And uh, we moved him to fullback when he came to Florida State. And uh, he just, he, he had a, a tremendous career at Florida State. I think he started four, four straight years for us. A uh, big back from Buffalo, New York. By his junior and senior seasons, he was doing just that. Now the big guy, Mark Lyles, gets the call and barrels his way into the end zone. As a junior, his rushing and pass receiving combined for nearly 1,000 yards. As a senior, he went over the 1,000-yard mark and helped lead one of FSU's greatest comebacks of all time. Trailing 21-7 with 11 minutes to go in a game at Cincinnati, the Knolls rallied for a 26-21 win. In that game, Lyle scored two touchdowns, rushed for 142 yards, and had 92 yards in reception, including a key 31-yard catch that set up the Knolls' winning touchdown. That game is when our whole freshmen, sophomore, juniors, seniors, everybody came together and just focused on, let's just get the job done because, you know, I, me personally, I remember telling my coach that, you know, he's like, you know, hey, you guys are losing to these guys. And we were telling him, don't worry about that. Don't even worry about it. Don't stress yourself about that. And I said that personally, and I took it upon myself personally to be to make the best of what I said. So when we came back in, it was one, I had a couple of runs that even I was, uh, I mean, it was just, everything came together, the blocking, the passing. We all, we did everything in one quarter what we should have did in four. That's basically what happened. And we were that good of a team. During his career, Miles overcame a weight problem, a lack of playing time, and a bout with fumbleitis to become one of the Knowles' greatest running backs of all time. 
It's something that I can always tell my kids or always establish myself as something of accomplishment in my life. And I'm very grateful for the consideration. And I think I've been blessed. And it's not just by talent, but it's spiritually. It, 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 it uplifts me. Yes, it does. He finished his career with 2,218 yards and 20 rushing touchdowns. Marks that currently stand fifth on the FSU career total list. Mark Lyles, one of FSU's greatest. Last but certainly not least on the FSU list of top 10 running backs is Warwick Dunn. Dunn's career is a storybook with a happy ending, but its beginnings were tragic. Warwick's mother, a Louisiana police officer, was killed in the line of duty just prior to his enrolling at Florida State. But Dunn would turn tragedy into triumph. Dunn's career is one long highlight that began when he started taking direct snaps as a freshman and finished when he ran all over the Florida Gators in one of FSU's greatest wins, the 1996 regular season finale against Steve Spurrier's team. He showed the Florida Gator defense. He came to play today. 26-yard run, Warwick Dunn. For the record, Dunn is the only Seminole running back to rush for over 1,000 yards in three straight seasons. Coach Bowden, you know, took a chance on me in my sophomore year. For like with seven games, four more games, something like that. If I get a hundred and some yards, I can become a thousand yard rusher. Have you had one of those? You know, they haven't had one in a while. So I was just fortunate that I ran some luck the last few games and the Florida game I had, I happened to do it. And I think after that, I think they realized my ability and what I can do on the football field and just took advantage of it. Warwick Dunn, of course, uh, boy, what a, what a great career he had at Florida State. Uh, we actually, when we signed him, we signed him as a defensive back, but he wanted to try it at tailback, so we let him, and after we saw him, we felt like we'd better keep him there. So he gained 1,000 yards his, th three, his sophomore, junior, and senior year. We never registered him. And uh, the first year he played, we won the national championship. And uh, I think he scored 10 touchdowns that year. We could not have won it without him. Right? He's the all-time leading rusher in school history with 3,959 yards. He's also the single season leading rusher with 1,242 yards as a junior. Dunn holds the record for the most touchdowns scored in a career at Florida State with 49. He ran for over 100 yards an amazing 21 times, more than anyone else in FSU history. He was a three-time All-ACC pick and was also an All-Academic pick. And through it all, he was the same quiet, confident running back who never understood what the big deal was. To look at Dunn, you'd never know that so much ability could be packed into such a small frame. I have the confidence in myself. Can I go out and show everyone else? And I think all four years in college, that's what I tried to do. I, I want to let no one tell me that I can't do something. You can't do it? Okay. I'm. I'm I'm going to show you that I can do it, and that's basically what I try to do it. Warwick stood at just 5'8 and 170 pounds after dinner, but he had an uncanny ability to spin out of trouble and avoid the big hit. He seldom was hurt and generally just hurt the opponent. He was elusive. I mean, he, and, and he was small. The boy, he had hit a hole, and he was so short that he'd go underneath the hole and come out the other side. I've seen him do that many times. And to pick out a favorite Warwick Dunn highlight, well, it's simply not possible. To the 25, to the 20, to the 10, touchdown! Ward takes the snap, play action, drops, looks, pops out of the pocket, runs to his left, throws it downfield, it is caught by Dunn, he's got the first down to the 40, down to the 50, down to the side, under the 40, down to the 30, he separates, he's to the 20, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown!
Heisman candidate trying to get outside, cuts it back. Warren done with a great move, and now it's a foot race. Warren done for Here's the snap, blitz coming, picked up nicely, does top three. 25, he is to the 35, he's to the 40 yard. 35, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. Warren down to the 10, 5, touchdown, Florida State, 80 yards. Oh my, oh my, on that play there, the offensive line. A big game. 12 for the state. That's where they run. Done. Has five, has ten. He's loose. At the 35. Inside the 20. And he is down at the 12 yard block for Kubert. Carried the ball twice. We begin the drive at the 20, and we've got it to the 48-yard line. Don has accounted for all 28. What a run by Warwick Dunn, a 50-yarder. Like 106 yards. He got 56 yards in the first quarter. That's the first time he's touched the ball since then. And with 9.16 to go, several little fans finally have something to cheer about. It's been a while since that uh, Busby two-yard touchdown pass to Pearsall. First toss pitch goes right side. Dunn's going to throw. Dunn cocks it off, throws it to... It's caught at the 42! What a bad argument. Warwick Dunn is the finest running back in Florida State history. He embedded his name all over the FSU record books and set the benchmark for somebody else to shoot at. And in an era when college football players were leaving early for the fortunes of the NFL, Warwick Dunn chose to come back for his senior season and stay a part of the Seminole family. When he finished his career at FSU, Florida State retired his number 28 jersey, putting Dunn in a class with just a handful of other Florida State legends. But when it comes to Florida State running backs, Warwick Dunn is in a class by himself. Florida State football history is filled with a talented stable of running backs who over time have helped to run the Seminoles into history. While their styles were different in nature, it was the size of their hearts that made these players so great. These intense competitors took turns in the Florida State backfield, leaving memories that all will cherish. It's hard to imagine the program having as much success over its short life without the feet of these men. They all ran with grace and beauty, and the impact of their garden and golden feet will live on for years to come. Hamlet recovers. Warren takes an hit and again dug by Florida State. That was a great swing by Jenny Keene. There's Schneider right into the net in the double block. 
ball drops too far in front of Schneider. She just hits it right into the bottom of the net. But prior to that, Florida State really digging up some great attacks. Jenny Keene hammering away on the outside, and Florida's getting a lot better sets from Nikki Shade. Bolton the Hawks just has to throw it over and right into the block and a chance for Florida. Jenny Keene picks up the point. Mary Wise is really happy about that. She was talking to Nikki Shade at the end of the last time out, saying put the ball high outside for them so they can hit it, not too tight. She's doing exactly that. Hemlips lefty hit is dug that time. So now they'll come to Schneider. And on the dig, it was over the net, and Hawks right there to capitalize. Well, Hawks gets one on a silver platter as the overpass ball comes right off the dig of Jenny Manns, and Hawks is ready and just puts it down. I think if you're a middle blocker, you live for that moment. Oh, you're drooling when you see this coming. Just put it on a tee and let me hack. 5-3 <laughs> Florida now, and look at Aisha Thornton in the middle. There's Thorne. Boy, she does come with a game face. She certainly does, and she just puts away one of the best players in the country, and Nina Foster stifles her at the net. But Florida State hands the momentum right back as Hawks serve is into the net. Jennifer Sanchez checks in for Florida now, and she will serve her team down three at 6-3. Sanchez waiting to take over the reins of Nikki Shade, et cetera. There's Holly Schneider finding the hole and coming up with a kill. Well, that's Schneider's best shot at that cross-court angle, and that was about at the 11th foot line, right inside the sideline. Great execution by Schneider on the outside. Hemlip serves now for 